everyone, I'm Maria. I was born in Portugal 42 years ago. When I was two years old, my single mom, she was jobless, and she was going through a very difficult phase in her life. And this is when she met a poor refugee woman from Angola, a mother of six children. She was a widow, and she was a cleaner. When she met my mom and she saw her struggling, she didn't hesitate to offer help. Basically, she told my mom, why don't you go to the city, find a job, and I will take care of Maria until then. My mom went to the city, and, at that, and she never came back. At that stage, my mom, my birth mom, and Christina, they didn't know that my mother had an illness. And that illness caused my mom to have severe amnesia. So I became the seventh child of Christina. Christina's motto was, who feeds six, feeds seven. When I was nine years old, Christina had a sudden heart attack, and she passed away. Christina's daughters continued to raise me and kept my mom's, uh, Christina's promise. At the age of 12, I had to stop going to school. And pretty much from that point on, I was told the only thing I could expect to do in life was to be a cleaner. So my sisters, they taught me how to be the Ronaldo of the cleaning world. At the age of 18, I left Portugal, searching better opportunities. I went to Switzerland. I, started, uh, I got myself jobs as a cleaner. I, did, I was a nanny, I was a cleaner, I washed a lot of dishes in a rest restaurants, I cleaned tables, and I learned French. A few years later, I went to England, and I started my life from the scratch, all over again. I got myself cleaning jobs, nanny jobs. Sometimes I had to do three jobs, at three jobs to make the ends meet. Then, two years later, I went to the job center, and the people there encouraged me to apply to work for, as a cabin crew for Emirates Airlines. When I realized that the job interview was really super competitive, I decided that I was going to go to this job interview not as a candidate, I was going to go for this job interview as I was already a flight attendant to Emirates Airlines. I went to Benetton, do you know Benetton? I bought myself a suit that resembled the, uh, the closest to resemble a cabin crew online, did my hair like a fabulous cabin crew, did my grooming, went to the interview, and there was 100 candidates <gasps> for two jobs. I was one of them who got the job. I could not believe it. I felt like I won the lottery. I hit the jackpot. I can't believe it that they are paying me to go to Dubai, to travel all around the world, to stay in five-star hotels, and the only thing I had to do was asking my passengers, would you like chicken? Would you like beef? Would you like tea? Would you like coffee? Two years later, Emirates asked me to do a 24-hour layover in Bangladesh. And it was my first time that I was in a third world country. I was absolutely shocked. I could not believe that four hours away from Dubai, there was such a poverty. Myself, I thought I came from humble backgrounds, and I had come from a poor background, but I didn't know what was poverty until I saw for those 24 hours. Where most people, they only saw poverty, I saw so much potential. It was so sad for me to see so many children that they didn't even know they had so much potential. And if no one helped them, all that potential will go down to waste. 
So I decided to swap all my fancy flights from Mauritius, Seychelles, and I decided to go all my days off, swap all my flights to go to Bangladesh and start helping these children. My goal was simple, give them a quality education. And then I started to have all these visions of these children going to university, going to work in multinationals, becoming leaders. But I had a tiny little problem. The education in Bangladesh it was so bad, it was so appalling that it was, there was no way with that, with that type of education they were ever going to go escape poverty. So I decided to open my own school. I started with 39 children. Funding kept, came, uh, kept coming. These 29 children, 39 children became 98, 200, and 600 children. No? <laughs> I'm going to be super honest with you. <laughs> when I opened that school, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to run a school. But I asked for people's helps, help. I asked teachers, volunteers, experts to teach me A to Z how to run a successful school. And together with these volunteers and sponsors, we opened a daycare center, a primary school, a secondary school, computer center, beauty salon, internet cafe, library, a dental center, a first aid center. For three years, I had the most beautiful school in Dhaka. Then, three years later, things started to go really super wrong. What happened three years later? Recession came. The financial crisis came, and I started losing my sponsorships. And I was really desperate at the time. So I went on Google and I typed, what is the quickest and most efficient way of raising funds? And Google told me, to raise money, to keep this organization going, you, have, you sh should find a celebrity like Angelina Jolie, Ronaldo, they organize a gala, and you'll get the funding you need send letters to them and famous people. Another one was to go on a very popular TV show, send letters to all TV shows. And then a very interesting article came on about a team, of, a team from England was going to the North Pole. They had raised one million pounds, and they were hoping by reaching the North Pole, they were going to raise two million pounds. So at that stage of my life, I was working as a first-class cabin crew going from galley to the cabin, hardly an athlete. I found myself a trainer, and I asked him to transform me into an athlete so I could reach the North Pole and get one million pounds. Went to the North Pole four months later, came back. I didn't get my million pounds. However, I got a school in Dubai to offer a tremendous opportunity for five children to come from the slums of Taka to come to Dubai all expenses paid to attend one of the best schools in Dubai for seven years. It was worth it half a million dollars. These five children's lives it was secured, but I still had the 595 in Dhaka. Angelina Jolie didn't respond, Ronaldo didn't respond, TV shows didn't respond. I went back to Google, and Google said, did you know the first Jordanian man that climbed Everest, he raised two million dollars? <sighs> Two million dollars? Wouldn't you climb Everest to raise two million dollars? So I Googled on the internet, I found an expert, 35 years of experience climber, and I asked him to transform me in a top-class climb, uh, Everest climber. Satya told me, Maria, I can train you in two years to get up to the top of Everest and come back down. I told him, Satya, in a third world country, Two years is a long time. We need to do this in one year. And we embarked in a, one of the most difficult uh, journeys of my life. Training for the, I was training up to six hours a day, gym, climbing uh, buildings, pulling tires on a beach. Meanwhile, in Dhaka, the board directors, they were pushing down, giving me a lot of pressure to close the project because we were drowning. 
And I could not find people to believe that I could get to the top of Everest and they were not willing to pay for the expenses of the expedition. 24 hours before the expedition started, I got my $10,000 to go and start the expedition. Six weeks later, I became the first and only Portuguese woman to climb Everest. <laughs> Came back down, all my fingers, toes, nose intact, but no million dollars, no two million dollars. Apparently, becoming the first Portuguese woman to climb Everest it was not big news after all. The, the board directors closed down the project, the kids went back to the slums, they went back to the remote villages, some of the girls, they got married, and I just thought, I have to do something big to bring back these children back to school. Went back to Google, no, actually, someone at the time said, Maria, when you thought about climbing Everest, you were thinking too small, because you're only targeting Portugal. If you really are serious about raising $2 million, you should do something that the whole world knows about you. So someone told me, why don't you run marathons around the world? So I contacted Nike, and I told them, listen, I went to the North Pole, I climbed Everest, can you transform me into a marathon runner who breaks Guinness World Records to really hit the media and get my million or two million dollars? Nike was really excited, we started training. Three weeks, wait, three weeks later, they dumped me. They told me, you're so bad at running, <laughs> there's no way you're going to even do one marathon. I thought, ha, 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 I am a marathon runner who cannot transform me is Nike. I will find someone who's going to transform me into a marathon runner. Fast forward one year, I broke four Guinness World Records by running marathons around the world. 2015, I, run, I broke another two Guinness World Records by being the fastest woman to run the seven continents. Raised some money. <laughs> Came 2016, I was not raising enough money with these Guinness World Records. And I, was, I had the schools threatening me to take me to court for not paying the, the fees, the school fees. I went back to Google and I told Google, give me something, something so big that the world cannot ignore me. And Google said, did you know if you swam across the English Channel, that is equivalent to climbing Everest on a swimming world. Fantastic. I, I registered to swim across the English Channel, got myself a pilot, went to the doctor, asked him, can you sign me to I am fit to swim across the English Channel? He did. Sent all my documents to the Channel Swimming Association, and then it was time to start training. But there was a tiny little problem. I did not know how to swim. <laughs> hey, it was only 32 kilometers, and I just figured it out. A lawyer is not a lawyer, one is born, an accountant is not an accountant, and I'm certain, positive, that my swimming instructor, when he was born, he did not know how to swim. I learned how to swim, when they came to swim across the English Channel one year later, and for, I didn't make it. <laughs> I swam seven hours, the currents, they were really strong, and instead of swimming from England to France, I was swimming the wrong direction. I was not making any progress, the pilot aborted to swim. And I thought, I cannot go through this again on the way back. Another failure like Everest. I let down the kids, what am I going to do? When I got home, I had 500 followers on my social media. During those seven hours that I was attempting to become the first Portuguese woman to swim across the English Channel, there was such an explosion, so many likes. You went from 500 to 10,000 in seven hours. And those people, they, raised, they donated the money to pay my debts. Since then, since the English Channel in 2016, I did an expedition to South Pole. I became the first Portuguese woman to get to the South Pole. 
I broke more Guinness World Records on Ironmans. <laughs> I climbed more money. Uh, I climbed more mountains. And every challenge I do, I raise a little bit more money to keep the project going. I raise a bit more of awareness. A lot of people they ask me, "What's the structure of this organization?" I am a one. I have been a one-woman show for 14 and a half years. Now and then, I get some volunteers that they help me. You know, when people like you come forward to help me, I can help more children, and the legacy becomes much bigger. Oh. <laughs> 14 years later, the children they are no longer children. They are young adults going to universities in USA. Australia, Dubai, Portugal, and France. <laughs> and now I would like you to watch a video. <laughs> I'd like you to watch a video. My aim is to be a prime minister of Bangladesh and help my country and change my country and yeah. Thank you. My name is Shuli, and in 2034, I will be the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. <laughs> I'm a dreamer a slum girl, and yes, the future Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Confused? 14 years ago, I would never have dreamt of being a strong, independent, and progressive woman. I lived in Shanti Town in Dhaka, Bangladesh. My future was written, get married of at 11 to an older man, become an uneducated housewife, and be confined to living my whole life in Gawar, a small village that I believe was the entire world. That is, of course, until somebody walked in and improved my life forever. I was six years old when I met Maria. And since then, my life completely changed. I am 20 years old now, and for the last 14 years, she has been supporting the underprivileged children to go to school and obtain quality education. This provides me, and many others like me, an opportunity to dream big. Like, big. <laughs> when we met her in, in 2005 for the first time, we didn't know a human like her existed in the world, because we didn't know any other skin color than black and brown. I never knew a world existed beyond Gawair, my village. It was my entire world. Countries such as UK, UAE, Portugal, US, and Australia were beyond my imaginations. It's unheard of. You need to understand that I'm from a world where children as young as five years old are totally normal to go and do jobs in extreme conditions, like construction site, laborers, uh, local restaurants and garments factories, or do highly dangerous labor works. When girls get their first period, parents and the society think it's totally normal for them to get married to someone who is three to five times older than her, as long as they can provide financial support. Age is just a number. I have a friend, his name is Milan, who came to Dubai in, in, in 2010 and who finished his high school with me, and he's in Australia right now doing his psychology course. Guess what? It's the same boy in 2000, 
five, who was five to six years old, working in a local restaurant, and his salary was only breakfast, dinner, and lunch. One day, suddenly comes a, a strange voice in my ears and tells me a totally different thing that I never heard before from anyone, neither from my family, friends, and society. And that strange voice was from Maria, that surely dream big, as big as you want, because you're capable of being anything you want to be in your life. You could be the next leader, next Richard Branson, next Elon Musk, CEO of a multinational companies and change the world for better. You can and you will. So this is my story. So today I decide to say, uh, I can and I will. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a breaking news. Yesterday evening, I received a message from my friends in Dhaka saying 20 of my people got accepted to do hardware course. All expenses are being paid. People, this is just the beginning. I am getting ready. I'm getting ready to, to, um, to have my cabinet in 2034. Please welcome some of my future cabinets on stage. Jangir, Asha Mune, Rita, Shumi, Lily, Matubi. <laughs> These ones, there are only a few out of the 18 that they are here studying in university in Braganza. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to our story. We hope that our story has inspired you to go back to your communities and believe that you can make change in your community, reshape and transform your communities, your organizations, your industry, and who knows, even the whole society. Thank you so much.